Peter chapter 1 and verse 19. He says, we also have a more sure word of prophecy. Whereunto you dwell, you will, you do well that you take heed as unto a light that shineth in dark place until the day dawn and a day star arise in your heart. Our son this morning is trying to make you know that you are a star and you have to shine. When you shine, you bring healing. You shine, you bring joy. You shine, you bring salvation. And keep shining until Jesus comes. This morning, to have now missed a man who 60 years ago he obeyed the call to serve God. For 60 years, traveling around the world, bringing the light of the gospel to the nations, and by example of his life and the word of his mouth, drawing millions of people to Christ and thousands of people to obey the service of God's call upon their lives. Our brother, father, grandfather, great-grandfather, George Bauer, came in from 
from out of Nigeria to be part of Nigeria because he told me years ago, I love Nigeria. Brothers and sisters, put your hands together as a welcome. George Bauer, the founder of Operation Mobilization, and now stepping out of that organization to provide special service to the body of Christ around the world. Tired but not tired. Strong in heart and serving the Lord. Let me pray with you. Lord, we thank you for sending us a gift in the person of your servants. We receive his ministry this morning again with deep sense of gratitude for sustaining his life, providing a voice for yourself in this man. Ask, O oh Lord, right now, may your word ring through him to the hearts of men and women gathered here this morning. In our Redeemer's name, I pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Jesus said, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every person. And just before he ascended, just before he ascended into heaven, one of the most important verses in the whole of the Word of God, Acts 1.8, and the Holy Spirit has come upon you, you shall be my witnesses in Jer Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost part of the earth. In Matthew chapter 9, the Lord Jesus, after giving an example, going out into the towns and villages, being among the poor, healing, said the harvest is plenteous, but the workers are few. Pray ye, the Lord of the harvest, that he'll send forth workers into the harvest. I'm here because of a woman of prayer. I'm not from a Christian home. My grandfather from the land of the Netherlands, a small land in Europe, he was an atheist and very much against the church. And he moved to New York City with my father, who was a boy. My other grandfather was Scottish, Irish, and English blood mixed. Seems to me basically toxic. He was an alcoholic. And my grandmother divorced him. So at 16, I had the name Christian. Many people have the name Christian. It's just a cultural thing, especially in America, Germany, Sweden, all these nations. And I've been in a hundred nations. Some of the worst people in the world have the name Christian. In Texas, thousands and thousands are in prison, some for murder, quite strong that they are Christians. And so globally, the word Christian is becoming more and more confusing. I'm not saying we never use the term. God knows how to work in confusion. And a few of you can pick up my book, my brand new book, only being released on Wednesday in London with the film of my life story. My sixth or seventh book, More Drops, Mystery, Mercy, and Messiology how God works through all kinds of people, all kinds of situations. It's about radical grace. The word messiology is my own word. It's the theology of the way God can work even when we fail. Failure can be even the back door to success. I know from personal experience. Yes, I'm here because a woman prayed for me. And I know many of you are women of prayer, and I want to commend you. People may not know you, but the Bible says the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty unto God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations, and every high thing that exalteth itself against God. That dear woman of God who was living next to my high school when I was 16, 15, that's, that's how she knew about me. She put my name on her Holy Ghost hit list, her prayer list. She not only prayed that I would become a Christian, that I'd become a true believer in Jesus, but that I would become a missionary. Imagine that. She didn't even discuss this with me. I had other plans for my life. I was already in business and had learned how to make money when I was only 13 years old. 
and I was very happy. My big thing was sports and dancing, and lots of different girlfriends. So I'm okay. But she kept praying for me and sent me part of the Word of God through the post, a Gospel of John. And as I began to read this Gospel of John, at that same time, pornography started to come into my life. And this battle was going on between darkness and light, between heaven and hell. And that battle may be going on with some of you sitting here this morning. And I pray that you will choose heaven. I pray that you'll choose to believe on the Lord Jesus with all your heart and follow him. Though I read this Gospel of John and in my head I believed, nothing much happened in my life until God's servant, Billy Graham, came to my city, New York City. He came just for one night, very unusual. And thanks to a business person, the story has never been properly told about how God uses business people. And if some of you are in business and you've put your business in the hands of God, I'd love to hear from you and pray for you. I'm in touch with hundreds of businessmen and women around the world. Without business people, global missions would not be what it is today. We in Operation Mobilization would not have our ship, Lagos Hope, or the three other ships. By the way, I sailed into Nigeria in 1971 on our first ship, and the welcome we had in Lagos with our ship, we will never forget. And Nigeria has burned on our hearts ever since. And we thank the Lord for Nigerians who have worked in Operation Mobilization as we have a special partnership with CAPRO, a movement that I'm sure many of you know about. By the way, I want to pay tribute to your church. I've had a lot of time with your senior pastor ever since I first arrived here. And uh, we found ourselves so like-minded and so of one heart. And I ask you to pray for him as he's in the Middle East, the number one area of the world where OM, Operation Mobilization, is working is the Middle East, Turkey, Lebanon. We have 1,000 workers among Muslim people. And we hope your pastor maybe meets some of them during his important trip there. This lady kept praying. Billy Graham came to New York. A business person gave me a seat on a bus, a coach into the center where the campaign was, Madison Square Garden, a famous fight arena. I sat as far away as I could. I would heard negative things against Billy Graham. He was very criticized. It's just a miracle I was there. This was not my culture. God heard the prayers of that woman. And when I heard the gospel, ye must be born again. Billy Graham says you're walking in one direction, you do a U-turn, and you go in God's direction. And when Billy Graham called people to repent and believe on Jesus, I got out of my seat and went up in front of 20,000 people. I began to weep under the conviction of the Holy Spirit and trusted the Lord Jesus as my Savior. I know that most of you, including some who are new in the faith, have taken that great step of faith. But if you've not yet done that, I pray this day, in the near future, you may believe on the Lord Jesus. It's not by works of righteousness which we can do, but according to what the Lord Jesus has done on the cross. I immediately sensed the call of God. I know it doesn't always work that way. God works in different people in different ways. But I immediately, immediately sensed that I must start giving out this Gospel of John everywhere. I was about to be elected as the president of the student government in this school, which gave me tremendous open door. And soon we distributed 1,000 Gospels of John in this semi-pagan high school where sometimes one-third of all the students were completely drunk on the weekend. 
and out having their sex and every other kind of crazy thing. And God began to move in that high school because that woman had prayed 15, 20 years for that high school. And we need to pray for our schools because the enemy wants to take over every school in Nigeria, whether it has the name Christian or whatever name it may have. And we need to pray for our young people and for our children. And I'm sure, sure you are. Yes, that night I was born from above and I've been sharing Jesus pretty well every single day ever since because of the reality of the indwelling Holy Spirit, because of the power of the Word of God, and because more and more people, when they saw me struggling as a young Christian, they showed love to me, and they gave me some books to read. And that lady, who later became my friend, uh, prayed for me when I went across the United States giving out Gospels. I was still in business at the time, selling fire extinguishers and Gospels of John at the same time. And then God led me to Mexico, which became, way back in 1957, one of the birthplaces of short-term missions. Last summer, over one million people across the globe were in short-term missions. What OM and YWAM and a few others pioneered in the 50s has been embraced by almost every major mission organization. It has been embraced by a huge percentage of churches so that churches, they don't actually need OM. <laughs> they have their own operation mobilization within their church. And you're one of those churches that has such a great vision for missions. I wanted to pay this tribute to you for being host to this great mission mobilization event led by my brother Timothy, who was in influential in bringing me back to Nigeria again when I have more invitations around the globe than I could ever accept in two lifetimes. And we just finished a four-day conference here. And I want to thank so many members of your church. They served us. They picked me up at the airport. They picked me up at the hotel. And uh, we have no way of expressing our gratitude. Many churches all over the world would never do what your church does. Because they only... Yes, praise the Lord. Because they only, they only will do anything if it's their church, if it's their denomination. Your church belongs to a very famous, large denomination. I've met people like dear Jack Hayford, who's been such a godly influence in America with the Four Square Movement and helping it to become big-hearted and embrace interdenominational events and conferences like we've just had here the last four days. And, of course, your pastor was one of the main uh, speakers at that conference. I wonder if you realize how much God loves you individually. I had difficulty, even as a Christian, really fully grasping that God loves me, especially when I had failure, and especially when I had failure with a pornographic magazine once that was actually in a tree in the woods there in London. And you know, when you fail with the lust of your eyes, if you're my kind of high goal, high aiming visionary, you feel completely destroyed. You feel, how can God ever use you? And I stand still amazed, though God has used me these 60 years to give the gospel with the mobilization teams around the world to more than one billion people, almost unheard of in the history of the church. I'm still amazed. I'm still amazed that God could use a character like me. One of the stories that's helped me realize God loves me even when I fail, even when I do something stupid, is a story I got from a man named Tony Campolo. It's about 
a thunderstorm. And yesterday when I was, I've been working in the gym and swimming each day for exercise, and yesterday when I went out to swim, <laughs> of course, we suddenly had a big thunderclap. And of course, usually lightning comes with the thunder. I don't know if it did yesterday. But in my story, there was terrific lightning and loud thunder. Even the older uh, parents in their home were quite nervous about this storm. Then they remembered that their little girl, little seven-year-old girl, was alone up in her bedroom. And so they ran upstairs, very worried about her. They opened the door. They thought she'd be hiding under the bed. Guess where the little girl was? In this terrible storm. She was looking out the window. They said, are you okay? She said, I'm fine. Boom, another flash of lightning. Huh, I'm fine. I, I think God is taking my picture. <laughs> Hallelujah. God ministered to me through that story that he loves me even when I fail. We've had quite a few struggles in our marriage. My wife and I are what's called a Bible college marriage. Do you have those in Nigeria? We met in Bible college. We felt the Holy Spirit leading us to get married. She thought I was a man of God, not originally. I had, I had so many problems with girls, even after I became a Christian. And so confused. Some uh, Christian said to me, no more kissing. I didn't see that in the Bible. <laughs> Billy Graham didn't say anything about that. And so I was kissing any girl available. I was quite proud because I wasn't having sex. I was like a Pharisee. You know, I'm only kissing and a few other things. And one day I helped this girl come to Jesus. And she accepted the Lord. I felt so encouraged. You know, when you help someone comes to Christ, you get a wonderful feeling. But then I kissed her for the next hour. And that's, of course, not in the Bible or any of the other books, even in my own books. So I went on a fast. Two years, no more dating, which is very much a part of the New York City culture. Maybe different here. No more dating. No more kissing. Whoa, a little bit with my pillow. That's when I went to Mexico. That's when I learned Spanish. That's when I began to understand spiritual warfare. That's when I began to lead many people to Jesus. And that's when this work was born, though it was only in Europe when our work took off in a major way called Operation Mobilization. So now I'm, I leave university because of my experience in Mexico. I arrive at Moody Bible Institute. Have you heard of these kind of places? You're there to study the Bible. But I have two years in which no girlfriend, two years no kissing. Now I'm in Moody Bible Institute. Everywhere I looked, there's beautiful girls. And I thought, well, they know Jesus, so they're, so they're safe. You know, probably if you tried to kiss one, boom, they hit you with a King James Bible. <laughs> so I was infatuated with a lot of girls, but I didn't do anything. I just kept prayer, ministry, study, evangelism. And because I went to rent an evangelistic film, I didn't have to do this. It was not part of the program. I went the extra mile to reach men and women in Chicago with the gospel. Because of that, I met this amazing woman. I got out at the elevator on the eighth floor at Moody Institute in Chicago, and I saw this woman who was in charge of the films. Whoa! My romantic circuits blew. I, I broke my fast and moved in on the target. <laughs> I was so emotional. I said something completely stupid. She, I, you know, for me, it was just love at first sight. As soon as I spoke for her, it was fright at first sight. And she was not interested. But I managed to get her on a sort of what you call a date. And uh, I was so emotional, I thought, maybe this is from the devil. And so I said to her, look, 
probably nothing going to happen between you and me, but you need to know, I'm going to be a missionary. And if you marry me, probably you will be martyred, eaten alive by cannibals in Papua New Guinea. I don't recommend that method for winning a woman's heart. And she was not interested, but I mobilized my prayer forces, and in God's mercy, when I asked her to marry me, coming back very tired from a Christmas campaign in Mexico, she agreed to marry me. Within a year, we got married, and uh, she accepted me as a Bible teacher. She thought I was a man of God. She's married a man of God. He knows the Word of God. So I gave her just that key verse, just not the whole chapter, Ephesians 5. Key verse, submit to your husband as unto the Lord. And she was very young. She was very naive. She just took it all in. I got her to sell all of her possessions for buying Bibles. She would be a millionaire today because she inherited a lot of money from her father killed in the war. I got her to even pretty well sell everything she had. I told her, no honeymoon, that costs money. We're not going to live in an apartment. We're going to live on the floor in the bookstore to save money to buy more Bibles. All kinds of crazy things I made her do. Uh, we went straight to Mexico after the marriage, just a quick marriage after the Sunday morning service. No rings, none of the normal wedding things. And we went to Mexico, and we had a tremendous marriage for several weeks. Hang on, hang on. For several weeks. Then she read the other verses. Then she read the whole chapter. Then the moment came when she began to express her viewpoint. Husbands, do you remember that? Shortly after the marriage, you thought you had this little quiet, submissive gal, and she began to loosen up, especially when you did something stupid in the kitchen, and share her viewpoint. To be honest, we discovered we were completely different. We could hardly have a conversation, except on, you know the Bible and missions we had in common. We, we couldn't even walk together. She liked to go very slow, very methodical. I like to move fast. That's why when we lived in India, it worked out a lot better in that culture because in India, we men always have to stay uh, several feet ahead of the women. But that's not true in Mexico City or in New York. But we discovered God's grace in marriage. We discovered this little book, Calvary Road, that I hope you'll get from your Christian bookshop. We gave away a lot of them during this conference, but they're all gone. But I'm sure you can get the, one of the most famous books in the world. The roots of that book come out of the great East African revival of the 50s that swept tens of thousands into the kingdom. And that book especially convicted me about impatience. It convicted me about irritability. It convicted me about attitudes. That God's concerned about our attitude, the attitude we have to other people, and especially people who don't like us. And God did a transformation work in our marriage failures. You may have a handicap. You may, you may like me, Often, often I don't experience answers to my prayer. I love to meet people who God seems to answer all my prayers. It's not the way it's been in my life. I remember praying for a man who was ill, that he would be healed. The next day, he was sicker than ever. Not very encouraging, is it? Maybe you don't have that experience. I've had a lot of doubts, a lot of struggles in my Christian life. The things that go on in churches as a young Christian were very confusing to me. And then I heard these stories of some of the crazy things that even Christian leaders did. I was listening to a sermon. I didn't ask to listen to this sermon in the car this morning coming from the hotel to the church. But some preacher, I think in Joss or maybe Lagos, was telling the most horrific stories about other Christian leaders having sex with different women, stealing money. A bear, I thought I was bold speaking on this subject, but this guy I just heard in one of your cars 
is a lot more bold than me. I guess that's why I developed this, this thing that I call messiology. Because I've seen God work in messy situations. We don't want a mess. People like me, as I led OM for 46 years, every day, we're committed to excellency. We're committed to holiness. We're committed to live a life of moral purity. But messiness is God's side. You see it from Genesis to Revelation. It's what God can still do when we do fail. We were the first major mission organization to recruit divorced people. We were highly criticized for that. But we didn't see in the Bible that divorced people could not serve Jesus Christ in global missions. Some of the greatest missionaries in history have been through divorce. Some have been through divorce and even in God's mercy given them another wife and used them still. I could write a whole book about it. Many people feel, maybe you're in this category, that they, they missed plan A in their life. They made a big mistake. They, some believers even end up in prison for a while. And so they feel they missed plan A. Now maybe they're on plan B. Many people feel they missed plan B. They made other stupid mistakes. When I go to prisons, I meet these people. Some of them are on plan H. They've had so many failures. Some of them three or four different wives. Do you know what I say to those people? Praise God for a big alphabet. Embrace the radical grace of Jesus and press on in the power of the Holy Spirit. God is using all kinds of people. Many, after sin and failure, they may walk. They may walk with a limp, but God can use them. There are many other verses I'd love to share, like Romans 12, 1 and 2. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your body as a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto him. Be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your, your mind. That's why it's so important to be regularly in the Word of God. That's why it's so important to memorize Scripture. That's why it's so important to take seriously the commands of Jesus. Once again this year in the United States is the Great Urbana Convention. You may not have heard of it. It's the biggest student convention in the world. 20,000 students from all over the world will be in St. Louis. I had the privilege when I was younger speaking three or four times at that Urbana event. And I remember once they sent me a letter and said, your topic for the next Urbana Convention with these students is the Lordship of Christ. I had already studied the Lordship of Christ. I had already preached on it. But in preparation for one of the most important meetings in my life, I buried myself in the Word of God. I studied other books, and I gave this message on the Lordship of Christ, which by video and YouTube has gone all over the world. And I want to encourage you to study what the Bible says about the Lordship of Jesus. We don't just receive Him as Savior. We receive Him as Lord and Savior. Now, when we're young and we first receive Him, we may not realize that. Don't judge some Christian because he didn't realize Jesus was Lord for the night he was saved. God is saving people through all kinds of of different evangelism and dreams and, and all kinds of different ways that God saves people. Be, be careful of being judgmental. I also talk about that in my book. As Christians often who love the Bible, like me, can develop this Pharisee streak. I have a fantastic book on that subject as well. God works in different people in different ways. He wants to use you. Do you realize the challenge of just living in Abuja? I'm so grateful for my few days here in your city. There are over two million people here from completely different religion, 
completely different culture. And without question, brothers and sisters, I say on the authority of the Word of God, I say expressing the voice of a thousand Christian leaders across the world and a, and a hundred books on global missions, that the mission field, the greatest mission field your church faces, and praise God for all you're doing around the world, your greatest mission field is right here. It's complicated. I know all the stories. I know all the excuses. But God can give us grace to reach out to people of totally different religion, of totally different culture. We need to become better listeners. We need to realize that we don't present Christendom. We present Jesus. We're not calling people to another religion and a different culture where they have to dress differently. We're calling people to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. And in Bangladesh and in Algeria, we've seen people of this background coming to Jesus by the thousands. And here in Nigeria, in some places, there are hundreds of these beautiful people that are always given bad publicity in the newspaper who are coming to Jesus. They don't all want to be called Christians, but they're coming to Jesus. They're worshiping Jesus. Many of them get baptized. Then they start winning others to Jesus. They're not always welcomed in the churches in places like Bangladesh where the believers are Hindu background. And so they meet in homes. They meet in Bible studies. And thousands in Bangladesh are following Jesus. 20,000 in Algeria, a different kind of movement, are following Jesus. And I'm sure one of the reasons God's put me in, in your beautiful nation again at this time is to give this call to reach out to those around you as complicated and as difficult as it is. You don't always, always immediately hit them with the hard questions. You listen. You find out what their prejudices are. You find out if they've ever read the gospel. You become familiar yourself with the Quran so you know the passages in the Quran about Jesus because people of all different religions very often highly esteem Jesus and we can therefore come and have an open door to share our faith with people that we thought would never listen to us. This is harvest time in Nigeria. We all know that, but now we need to become more radical in reaching out cross-culturally. How dare we send missionaries across the ocean at fantastic expense when we ourselves are not willing to walk across the street. May we humble ourselves before the Lord this morning. May we acknowledge that we're fearful. May we acknowledge that we have prejudice. And may we cast ourselves upon him for a fresh anointing and filling of the Holy Spirit to impact Abuja and in turn the nation and the world through the power of the Lord Jesus Christ. God bless you. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you. We thank you so much for what you're doing around the world. And Lord, we want you to be Lord of our lives. Search our hearts that we can be sure you are Lord of our money. You are Lord of our time. You are Lord of our sexuality. You are Lord of our future. You are Lord in our homes. You are Lord in the workplace. And help us on a daily basis to deal with sin, to, the, to do that Holy Ghost U-turn, to follow you with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. And Lord, we especially pray for this great city, now one of the more complicated cities in the world, that we would see miracles of grace here, as we've already seen, and that the people all around us, that many, many more of them will come to know Jesus, will come into relationship with the Lord Jesus, Use dreams. Use this great DVD video. Use your holy word. Use our feeble testimony. It's not for us, Lord, to tell you what method you use. For we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. I have one final request. If you listen to me for one more minute, and that is that we want to give everyone a free book. I'm very much involved in ministering around the world 
to people who have HIV AIDS. And we want to give every one of you a book on this subject. You may not read it right away, but just having it available, God is going to use you, I'm convinced, to help someone who has AIDS and doesn't know it. Because we all know in Nigeria, many have HIV AIDS, they don't know it, and they refuse to be tested. And I pray, because we're seeing around the world, the Church of Jesus Christ is becoming very proactive on this subject. So please receive this book as a gift, even if you're not going to read it right away. As a reminder to pray for me, what I'm attempting to do around the world. One of the messages I shared at the conference was the seven people laying by the side of the road. It's also listed on the back of my business card that I'll be giving some of you. The children laying by the side of the road, the abused women laying by the side of the road, and the HIV AIDS victim laying by the side of the road. So please, the ushers will have these books. Uh, we did a lot of work. We spent a lot of money. Not me, but Patrick Dixon and his organization, ASET, represented here in Nigeria, to make sure we had enough books for everyone. God bless you, and thank you very much. Just, uh, just before our brother sits down, are there a few people in the church today who have struggled with God's call upon their lives? You've debated with God, debated with yourself, argue about your suitability but listening to his story the reality of god's use of a life totally yielded and submitted to him not for one week not one year but for six decades I want to tap into that grace this morning i would like joy to pray for anybody in that situation will you stand on your feet and come to the altar you struggle with your call you you know it's there but it's like it's not been it's been a struggle with you Anyone? Let's make it quick. Reverend Richard, let go ask if you could do that. So that's why we're doing it. Many people have calls call upon their lives and they know the call is there. But every time the senior pastor preaches, anybody, any, when the guest minister speaks, they say, that's them because they are all clear, they are all neat, they are okay. But here is a life. Just yield it to God. Here is a life. Totally submitted to God. Yes, a life that just wants to do the will of God in spite of distractions, limitations, and frustration of sin and hell. God sent us a man just like us. To ask the Lord this morning, Lord, use me in spite of myself. Use me in spite of myself. Like that little girl looking out of the window saying, God is taking a picture of me. There is a life totally dependent on God. Just one more minute before I hand over the microphone to him to pray. To ask the Lord, the grace you gave this man for 60 full years, he told us how rotten, as it were, he was. How even after conversion, his weaknesses, but how God walked through all those things to make him a giant in the faith, to make him a pillar in the faith, to make him a man of intense spiritual personality, a man that some of us have related to over 30 years and have found joy to be a father to rely on, a father to confide in. I've seen over these 30 years, I've been part of his life, to see a man who can tap you on the shoulder and say, Timothy, it is where well. We're going to go forward. Anyone else you want to... Do this before I ask him to pray. Can I ask all the minister in the church to stand on their feet and stretch their hands towards the altar to receive grace and mercy, to join as we ask the Lord to breathe upon these lives the freshness of grace, to sustain these lives, that the call of God will not more rebound, will not become extinct in their lives, that the purpose and the plan of God will be actualized, that each of these lives we have stories to tell decades from now, 10 years from now, 20 years from now, they will say, I remember in Asokoro, the first quad church, they prayed over me. That was when the chain fell off. That was when the scale was removed. That was when I stood my ground 
for God's purpose. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Jesus. Father, you see each one kneeling before you. You know everything about us. We cannot hide anything, and you love us still. You're bathing us with your love. You're reminding us of the inheritance we have in your Son, the Lord Jesus, because of what he did on the cross. And Lord, I pray for great grace and spiritual strength for each one kneeling before you. I pray that they have a deep and greater experience with your Lordship concerning their time, concerning their sexuality, concerning the future, concerning their education, concerning family life, whether single or married. We ask, Lord, for total radical commitment to you, and we believe some will be sent out as missionaries to other parts of the world in this great Omega program. Maybe some will be led to join and work on a training year on the OM ship. Maybe everyone will have new boldness to share and show love to those around us who often do have some animosity and do have prejudices and wonder what we're really all about. Oh, Lord, this is a miracle moment, and we give you the praise. We give you the glory. In Jesus' name, amen. And I'd just like to say, each one who's come forward, I wasn't planning this, but if you email me, I'd like to send you one of my other books called No Turning Back, which is all about how to run the next 50, 60 years, whatever the Lord gives you. So an email or letter with your address very clear, and I'll make sure that book uh, that we print right here in Nigeria is sent to you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, please, wait a minute, wait a minute, don't go yet. Wait a minute. See this uncle, this gentleman in, um, in, Thai, in Thai with me. Just walk, walk towards him and walk to the end of the hall with him. Thank you very much. God bless you. Praise the Lord. Do we want to put our hands together for God?